the ranch. Our family ranch was standing on its last legs. Nearly a month had passed since the reset, and things were becoming dire. The few remaining hands Dad managed to keep on staff were willing to work for food and shelter, although they didn't seem very pleased at the idea of not getting a paycheck. It wasn't as if they had an option. From our understanding, no one was making money anymore. There were no more trucks coming in to offload feed or ones to take mature cattle to slaughter. We were a quiet homestead in the midst of endless plains as far as the eye could see. With so few people to help steer the herds, we locked them all into a two-acre corral. Without feed in their trials or land to graze, our livestock were slowly beginning to starve. We operated this ranch for generations and slowly watched it dwindle from its former glory. Dad had no idea what he could do to fix things. It all seemed out of our hands. We couldn't call anyone as the phones were down. What little power we did have from the generator was used sparingly. Each passing day, encroaching further into winter, was met with harsher elements to contend against. The house was kept warm thanks to a wood-burning stove, although even that had sparse logs of firewood that had to be strictly rationed. Dad's only option to contact the outside world was to send one of the cattlemen 30 miles into town to learn of any news that might grant us the slightest bit of helpful information. Once the worker drove our truck over the horizon, we never saw him again. Eventually, the workers felt their previous arrangement wasn't good enough. They demanded to sleep in our home and have unlimited access to our food, rather than be given meals in the bunkhouse. This home was our temple, a sacred place reserved for family, so naturally, my father revoked their demands. That's when the fighting began. With no one to aid him, my father was beaten to a pulp, and our family was thrown out to live where the workers slept. After the first night, I could see why they wanted out. There was a draft that sucked out most of the heat generated by the small wood-burning stove. My father, mother, and I spent the first night in the bunkhouse, huddled together near what little warmth we had while our empty bellies growled. I knew there was nothing left for us in the ranch, but I also knew it would be difficult convincing my father to leave. The workers wanted food and shelter, and they took it from us. It was only a matter of time before they gained a craving for the touch of a woman, as I'm sure they would look to my mother and myself to satisfy those devious urges. Against all odds, we woke up to a miracle. Just after the rising sun ushered forth the dawn of the new day, several trucks carrying bull racks lined up along the access roads running beside the corral. It was as if an entire crew had been sent to us, ready to take our herd to the slaughterhouse. Regardless of their intentions for arriving, Regardless of their intentions for arriving, it was a relief to have people around other than the disgruntled workers turned to thieving marauders. My family left the bunkhouse just as the workers came out of our home to see the commotion outside. A tall, gaunt woman looked at both groups, then requested to speak to the owner of the ranch. One of the workers proclaimed the property was under new management and demanded that all conversation should be held with the cattle hands in the main house. She shook her head and repeated that the only person she cared to speak with was the legal property owner of the land. Her refusal to validate the worker's claim to the ranch caused him to turn red, either out of embarrassment or frustration. As he began marching towards the woman, a couple of armed men approached him at gunpoint, making him freeze in place with his hands up. My father, weakly, raised a waving hand followed with a welcoming nod. The woman returned the nod and walked over to us with her hand out, eager to greet us. After exchanging a few pleasantries, I learned that her name was Alex, and she was here on behalf of the logistics company Helios. We then went inside the bunkhouse to continue the conversation. Although we didn't have much to offer our guest, my mother was able to brew a pot of coffee on the wood-burning stove, but the smell only made our hunger pains grow. I'll cut to the chase and give it to you all as direct as I possibly can. Alex smiled at my mother, took a thankful sip of her cup of coffee, then looked to my father in his bloodshot, bruised eyes. The world as you all knew it is no longer the same. There was a financial disaster that affected the entire global economy. As you are aware, most countries converted to crypto as their official currency. We still don't know why, but all of it vanished. The domino effect started here in the United States. One after another critical infrastructure began to fall, leading to an exponential collapse. First the power grid, then water and sewer services, then natural gas, cell towers, pretty much anything involved in providing the basic necessities for modern living. 
Once AWS servers were powered down, 70% of the world's internet infrastructure went with it. From what information we have been given, the rest of the world has been hit just as hard as us. For lack of a better phrase, we have entered a new dark age. So basically, Father struggled to comprehend what she was saying. Uh, the whole world is facing an economic depression? That would be preferable, but as things currently stand, what we are facing is an apocalyptic catastrophe. The economic collapse led to civil unrest, in turn that drove society to crumble apart. There is no power because there is no one to generate it. Money is worthless because there is no longer an economy to validate its worth. There are no laws because there is no government to enforce them. All that is left is survival. There was a moment of silence as we let our words sink in. We knew things were bad, but never imagined the reality of it all being so dire. If what she was saying was true, then I'm glad we were so far away from the bulk of society. I couldn't imagine trying to contend with hundreds of thousands of other people facing the disaster so close together. My father gave a heavy, sorrowful sigh as he accepted the sorry state of the world. And where does that leave us? I doubt you would have wasted the fuel coming out all this way just to tell us the world ended. By the looks of it, I reckon you and your team are gearing up to take the entire herd and be on your merry way. Alex took another sip of her cup, scrunching her brow at the bitter taste. Well, you are right about that. Usually, we wouldn't cross this far into Oklahoma. We had a chance getting here before your entire stock keeled over due to starvation. Judging by the looks of it, they are knocking on death's door as it is. The bad news, as you are very astutely aware, is that we are indeed taking all of your cattle. The good news is that we will compensate you for your cooperation. Father scoffed and slammed his fist to the table. Compensate? With what? You just said yourself. Money's worthless. Hell, before this whole shitstorm, it was worthless anyways, thanks to inflation. I tried paying those sorry fucks what little I had to offer, and a lot of good that did us. For my troubles, all I managed to get in return was an ass kick. Alex ignored my father's outburst and stood up. We'll be taking your cattle nearby to be slaughtered. Portion out the horde's yield and preserve it. Once that task is complete, we can offer you 10% of the total product. It is your property, after all, so it's only fair that you be granted a sizable cut. Of course, since I am the one with the trucks and the manpower to successfully make such things happen, that is why the offer is only 10%. You provide the raw materials, and I the means to turn it into a viable product. My father was a prideful, stubborn man, but he wasn't stupid. He knew that there was no rejecting her offer. With his blessing or not, Alex was taking the cattle. It didn't take long for him to agree to the deal, with the only condition that he wanted Alex to tell us how they were able to pull it all off, given the state of the larger world outside our quiet ranch. As her men started herding cattle into the trailers, Alex walked us through a simplified explanation of her relationship with her employer. Following the reset, there was an emergency order placed to secure the infrastructure and development of several major cities, places that would be easy to maintain while offering the best chance for the nation to recover from the economic collapse. The company she worked for, Helios, handled shipment and delivery of various goods around the country prior to the collapse. When the emergency order was enacted, several companies like Helios were granted protections and authorized to operate independently, so long as they assisted with sustaining the cities during the rebuilding effort. The company executives, their families, and the families of their employees would be allowed to live within the safety of those cities. It was the government's best effort to maintain law and order while establishing a working relationship with those who had the means to assist with such a large project. Alex was the head of one of several distro teams tasked with securing the countryside for food, water, and fuel to be distributed among the approved surviving settlements as part of the program. My father wanted to know if there was any way that our family could be approved to live in one of the cities, knowing that even with our share of the livestock, we wouldn't last long enough left to our own devices so far away from civilization. Alex pondered the request for a moment, then denied the idea altogether. She didn't have the authority to grant us clemency into one of the major cities. However, she did have an alternative. We would give up our cut of the livestock slaughtered, and in return, she would assist us in getting to a farm in Arkansas. It was one with hundreds of company-run farms tasked with supplying the rebuilding effort. There, we would be protected from roaming ravengers, groups far worse than my father's disgruntled cattle hands. In exchange for food, water, and shelter, we would work either on the farms or with their distribution. 
Although not ideal, it was the best offer that would provide safety to my mother and myself. In the end, that's all my father cared about. Losing all of his livestock, his ranch, everything our family spent generations building was worth protecting his family. When Alex asked my father what he wanted to do with the workers that beat him and took over our home, he just shook his head. Let them rot. The distro team went through the entire ranch collecting everything of value. The cans of food from the pantry, bags of dried goods, jars of preserves, every ounce of fuel left in the tractors near the barn. Every valuable resource was taken. My family made themselves comfortable in the semi-trucks. My father in one, my mother and myself in another. As the convoy departed the ranch with the cattle ready for what little meat they had left to be harvested, I looked to the side mirror of the truck and watched the workers slowly become smaller and smaller as we drove away. We left them in the middle of nowhere, with no food, no fuel, no water, and no sympathy.